I want to begin by uh, talking about a particular moment, uh, January 10th, 1865. It was the morning, cold winter morning for Savannah, and 500 African American children assembled in the first African Baptist Church on Franklin Square. There uh, they uh, mar from there they marched uh, across the square and into the old Bryan slave market uh, on the corner of St. Julian and City Market Street. They were marching to their new school, which was a former slave market. Their procession, this grand march of the children, excited as much attention from the residents of Savannah as the entrance of Sherman into the city, according to some observers. This was quite a spectacle. It was unique in the city's history. These children took up their seats on the second story of the slave market, and they're surrounded by whips and bills of sale, receipts for slaves. They commenced their lessons. Now, this march of the children had great symbolic and political significance in the city of Savannah. Savannah, as you probably know, is built on a grid, and that is because originally the city was something of a military encampment. This is a picture of Savannah when it was founded in 1733, and the purpose of the town was to provide a haven for sturdy, uh, householders, uh, respectable men from England who would begin their new life in the new world. And uh, as a result, the founders of the colony of Savannah wanted to bar lawyers and slaves, among other groups, because they wanted to give the sturdy homesteaders uh, a, a real opportunity to make a new life for themselves and their families. So we see uh, the, this early Savannah, which served as a buffer between Florida, a haven for runaway slaves, and also uh, there were forts manned by Spanish uh, soldiers in Florida. And uh, on the other side of uh, Georgia, of course, uh, South Carolina, the English colony. That's why the city had this grid pattern because it was built originally uh, to resemble a military camp of sorts. Well, the net effect was to um, make a city where the long straight streets were very conducive to processions and marches of all kinds. If you know Savannah today and you know the popularity of the St. Patrick's Day parade in March of every year, uh, you'll understand that the city historically has embraced processions of all kinds. Political parades, Washington's birthday, Sunday school processions, funerals, and the annual May Firemen's Parade uh, were among the most popular of all uh, processions in the city. Here is a rare photograph, uh, early uh, daguerreotype, I guess, of a African uh, American, African American fireman in Savannah, interestingly enough, uh, enslaved and free men of color form the backbone of the city's fire department. And their procession at the end of May marked uh, a very significant uh, uh, event in the city when everyone came out to see this display and to see these marchers. To give you an idea of what I call the political significance of parades, consider the funeral 
of a mayor who died in office in 1858. That was Mayor Richard Wayne, who was a graduate of Union College in New York, and he had received his medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania. Like many of Savannah's elites, he had attended Northern colleges. The funeral was held at the Episcopal Christ Church, and the funeral procession was estimated to be a mile long. It wended its way through the city streets to Laurel Grove Cemetery uh, at the other end of the city. Now, making up this procession were Mayor Wayne's widow, Henrietta, and his three daughters in a carriage, accompanied on foot by the, the family's slaves. Then in order were representatives of the voluntary militias in Savannah, including the Republican Blues and others, representatives of the white volunteer fire companies, the fraternal orders, including the United Ancient Order of Druids, the Masons, the Odd Fellows, representatives of the Union Society, a charitable group in Savannah, and then representatives of the city council, judges, and physicians. Now, Savannah was invested in preserving order in a very boisterous, prosperous river port. And processions were an opportunity for the city to highlight social order by literally putting everybody in his or her place within these uh, parades. So in that sense, we can understand the symbolic and the political significance of the march of the African-American children. They literally seized the streets to celebrate freedom and its promise. January 10th, 1865, not more than three weeks after Sherman had liberated the city in December of 1864. Now, what is really striking, I think, about the Children's March is that it was organized by a new group called the Savannah Education Association. This was an entirely black organized group, and it went to work immediately. It, uh, the uh, preachers, the African-American preachers in Savannah met on January 1st, 1865, an ecumenical group uh, representing all of the uh, churches, black churches in the city. They proceeded to hire 15 African-American teachers. They set up a finance committee, which established a way of funding this educational enterprise. Uh, dues for the uh, month were set at uh, 25 cents, uh, yearly dues, $3, and one could become a lifetime member for $10. And on January 1st, 1865, the African American community rushed to uh, provide funding for the Savannah Education Association, which netted $730 that day, a considerable sum for people just released from slavery. The SEA, the Savannah Education Association, sponsored five schools that uh, educated about 1,000 children. And again, all this within just a few weeks of the city's falling to Sherman. So what um, I would like to suggest here is the really remarkable nature of this organization. And it re reveals certainly the way that the African American community was very much integrated into the economic life of Savannah. Black workers served as teamsters, draymen, skilled craftsmen, laundresses, servants, and workers in cotton presses and sawmills. Uh, and I also want to suggest the importance here of the uh, independent uh, African-American churches in Savannah. 
This is a picture of Andrew C. Marshall, who was the pastor of First African Baptist Church uh, for many years in the antebellum period. He died in 1859 at the age of 100. He uh, and other preachers were tolerated by the white community because they believed these black preachers uh, offered a message of accommodation and subservience. What white elites did not uh, understand at the time, I think, was the coded message that preachers like Andrew Marshall offered. For instance, he preached at one point, how many of those to whom we are subject in the flesh have recognized our common master in heaven and they are our masters no longer. So a suggestion there about the brotherhood of the spirit, the unity of all uh, in the face of um, God. And this certainly encoded message gave uh, African Americans uh, hope and uh, provided a way for them to communicate themselves among themselves in a way that was uh, accepted and tolerated by whites at the time. The church is very significant because the, uh, in a unique way, I think, Savannah had independent African-American churches where the members elected their own trustees and their own officials. They took up pew rents. They offered Sunday school instruction to black children and pretty much organized themselves according to the way they wished. And I think it's the history of these independent black churches that provides a clue to the organization of the Savannah Education Association and why it could organize so quickly after Sherman's entry into the city. Uh, also, we look before the war for clues about the organization of the black community. This is Charles de la Mata. He was an officer in one of the many mutual aid societies uh, within the black community before the Civil War. He was a skilled slave uh, ship carpenter. He was active in the American Colonization Society, which was established to recolonize freed slaves to the country of Liberia in Africa. But Charles de la Mata, um, again, a good example of a leader who uh, was very much uh, in evidence before the Civil War and became active uh, during the war as well. So just for a moment, return to that grand march of the children where black children and their parents sought to claim the blessings of citizenship, but at the same time maintain their cultural autonomy and provide schooling for themselves on their own terms. Certainly this whole enterprise, the SEA, was the furthest thing from the minds of secessionists when they took Georgia out of the Union in January of 1861. The purpose of those uh, secessionists, of course, was to pr preserve slavery and to preserve the Southern way of life. And Savannah, in Savannah, that way of life meant preserving the very prosperous river port, which depended on lumber, rice, and cotton. Those staples would come down from the interior via the Savannah River or uh, on the uh, railroad cars of the uh, Central, uh, the Georgia Central Railroad. In some cases, the rice uh, along the coast was collected by flatboats and schooners and brought to the docks of Savannah, where it would be, in some cases, processed, uh, repackaged, and then sent to the north or to parts of Europe. I should uh, emphasize here, then, that Savannah's prosperity very much rested on the backs of enslaved workers in the surrounding countryside. And certainly the um, uh, slave econ economy uh, in the surrounding countryside was 
uh, remarkable for uh, several reasons. One, rice cultivation depended on kind of a hydraulic system of irrigating the fields. The uh, uh, river waters pushed up by the tides would then be used to flood the fields with fresh water uh, through a complicated system of dikes and trunks. Here is a, uh, again, very rare photograph of uh, two enslaved workers in the rice fields. Uh, two, the ground was too soft to use mules or other animals. The man is pulling the plow. I should also stress that rice cultivation was extremely dangerous and deadly. Uh, estimates for some of these rice plantations were that infant mortality rates were 90%. That meant that out of 10 children, uh, nine died before their first birthday. Their mothers were drinking polluted water. There were a lot of gastrointestinal diseases. Uh, enslaved workers contracted respiratory diseases as well. So a constant need to replenish the enslaved workforces in the surrounding low country. But as I suggested, within the city of Savannah, the uh, uh, black men and women were very much integrated into the city's economy. And uh, here is a, uh, a peddler, for instance. Uh, black draymen and teamsters were crucial for getting the rice from the central of Georgia depot down to the docks. And also uh, a picture here of um, an enslaved woman carrying a bundle on her head in the African style. It might have been firewood or laundry, we're not sure, but she's descending from the bay, which was that main street there in Savannah down to the docks and River Street. Now, maintaining order in Savannah was a perpetual preoccupation for white elites because the city was so boisterous and lively. And every October or November, large numbers of seasonal laborers came into the city from New York. Many of them were Irish immigrants coming down to work as dock workers from October through April or May, the busy season. Uh, in addition, uh, in 1860, the population of the city was about 22,000, almost half of those were African Americans and about 1,000 were free people of color. And as I mentioned, they were skilled workers of all kinds. So we see then um, a challenge among white elites how to maintain hierarchies of white over black, rich over poor, in a very lively, vibrant river port economy, which depended as much on the labor of enslaved workers and free people of color as it did on the labor of these migrants coming down from the north every year. Well, how was this unity among white men achieved? How did the elites manage to uh, maintain the loyalty of poor whites uh, in the antebellum period? This unity, I think, was achieved through associations that cut across class lines, through the voluntary white firemen's associations, for example, through church congregations, which drew uh, whites from all classes all over the city. The militias, which were, of course, integral to Savannah's uh, life, those voluntary military groups which would practice and drill in the city's parks. But I think, um, and also charitable organizations in some cases brought together whites of, of different kinds, different ethnicities, different religions in common purpose. But I think the most, 
the most important association maintaining the loyalty of all white people in Savannah was the Democratic Party, which certainly appealed to uh, these uh, new dock workers who managed to vote. It's not sure why, since six months residency was required in order to vote in, for, in elections in Savannah. But certainly these dock workers were very much an integral part of the Democratic Party. Uh, so we see uh, this need to maintain order in a city which is kind of messy uh, and that is when you walk down the streets you weren't sure uh, what the status of any one particular person might be whether he uh, or she was a wage earner an enslaved worker a free person of color and so forth uh, before I go on to I just wanted to mention the significance of the federal pre uh, presence in Savannah before the war this is the US Custom House on Bay Street. This is actually a very modern photograph, but the uh, federal government was very much involved in the life of the city. It maintained a custom house which provided a lot of patronage jobs for local residents. It also provided subsidies for a local hospital that catered to seamen who were ill. Those sailors who came in on ships from various parts of the world, their ship captains could not care for them. The um, poorhouse and hospital did, and that was subsidized by the federal government. Now, I just make these points because I want to uh, stress uh, and reiterate this idea that the Civil War provoked unanticipated consequences for the city of Savannah. The city was upended and transformed as a result of the war. And this, again, was the farthest thing from the minds of the secessionists who took the state out of the Union. Uh, and uh, the loss of federal patronage uh, turned out to be a problem, certainly. One of the major themes of my book also is the spirit of enterprise shown not only among the city's wealthy merchants, bank, wealthy merchants, bankers, cotton factors, attorneys, and planters, but a spirit of enterprise among free people of color and enslaved workers as well. Men and women who took advantage of the city's distress during the war to profit accordingly. So let's go back to secession um, and what I call these unanticipated consequences. As early as December 1860, when South Carolina seceded from the Union, December 20th, it was the first state to go, businesses in Savannah began to register the effects of an impending conflict. And, and keep in mind that this is five months or so before the war actually broke out. But as I suggested, the, the city's economy depended very much on the lumber, rice, and cotton trade. And many merchants were reluctant to send staples north, not knowing whether they would be paid for those staples if some kind of war broke out. So to make a long story short, Life on the docks, the work on the docks, came to a screeching halt there at the end of 1860. Those workers who had come from the north to labor on the docks were sent home by the city council. City council helped pay their passage back because there wasn't any work for them to do. Some of the banks were approached by the governor, Joe Brown, and asked to buy bonds to help with any war effort that might uh, uh, take place. And the banks were um, beginning to reel from the effects of this slowdown in business and were very uh, wary of lending money to the state at this point. Also, uh, vigilantes began to attack suspected abolitionists and Yankees and other suspect persons in Savannah and uh, try and root out sources of subversion. Some elites were very uh, upset that these vigilante groups were usurping normal processes of law enforcement. Uh, 
And some of those who uh, endured the scorn and the suspicion of Savanians included uh, elites. This is a, a picture of Nellie Kinsey Gordon. She was uh, recently married to Willie Gordon, the scion of a very wealthy family in Savannah. And during the war, while her husband was off at war, she endured the taunts of her uh, close uh, in-laws with whom she was living and uh, neighbors who disparaged her because her uncle, General David Hunter, was a prominent uh, officer in the Union Army and stationed uh, right off the coast of Savannah for much of the war. So we see uh, very early on then that this very uh, hierarchical society is beginning to show the effects of uh, this uh, radical transformation. I spoke about the solidarity of white men regardless of class. And one of the uh, issues that prompted divisions among whites was the uh, assignment of white troops to the coast during the war. This is Charles Colcock Jones, who was the son of the famous uh, preacher, the um, uh, Liberty County preacher, Reverend Charles. C. Jones. And uh, Charles, Charles Jones Jr. enlisted in the summer of 1861 in Captain Joseph S. Claghorn's company, the Chatham Artillery, Artillery First Volunteer Regiment, Georgia Artillery. He was stationed on the coast and he took uh, a valet and a servant with him to the encampment there, and every week he could count on supplies of fresh fruits and vegetables, baked goods, and even packages of freshly laundered clothing from his mother, who lived nearby. She sent those things down. And his life in camp and the life of George Mercer and other uh, Confederate officers was actually quite pleasant, and they wrote uh, about it in glowing terms. But meanwhile, the enlisted men who were serving under them on the coast were enduring sand flies, mosquitoes, uh, unpalatable food, uh, various uh, epidemics rushed through these encampments, measles, and so forth. And there uh, emerges a kind of grumbling among the enlisted men about their condition compared to the, revel the relatively privileged position of their officers. So, some of the solidarity among whites then was certainly challenged during the war. And I like this uh, picture which appeared in Frank Leslie's Illustrated magazine in December of 1861. It's called The Indiscriminate Flight of the Inhabitants. <laughs> and it suggests the panic that overtook Savannah at, in that month when the uh, U.S. Army occupied Tybee Island, which was, of course, at the mouth of the Savannah River. And some uh, residents decided that an invasion was imminent and they fled to the interior only to return within a few weeks when it was clear that uh, the U.S. Uh, Navy was not going to advance up the Savannah River. But we see then, um, again, a society upended by the... Um, vicissitudes of war. Uh, at any one time, as many as 9,000 Confederate uh, soldiers were stationed in Savannah, really um, causing havoc within the city. And as the war dragged on, certainly some of those soldiers had second thoughts about serving. When I was doing my research in the Georgia Historical Society, I read through issues of the Savannah Morning News. And in January of 1863, I was struck by a lot of advertisements on the very front of the, uh, the first page of the newspaper. And they described rewards for runaways and described uh, the physical characteristics of the fugitive, his hair color, his height, his weight, his name, where he might be hiding, and so forth. But these were not ads for runaway slaves. These were ads for soldiers who had deserted from the Confederate Army. And it is an indication of the toll the war was taking 
on the civilian population uh, uh, by that time. We also see evidence of anti-Semitism rearing its head in Savannah. Savannah had had a very ecumenical culture. Jews had helped settle the city in 1733, and they were very much a part of the city's elite. Uh, and yet there were um, rhetorical attacks, at least, anti-Semitic attacks on some Jewish merchants in the city during the um, war. By 1864, uh, the stress in the city is so great. Inflation of the currency, shortages of food, worry about the fate of loved ones on, on the battlefield, that uh, a group of women staged what was called a bread riot in April of that spring, where they ran through the city and looted bakeries of bread because their families were starving. So we see then that the initial intentions of the secession is to maintain the city, the Riverport's prosperity and its uh, hierarchical order. Um, oh, that intention was mocked by the, the wartime years. What was most striking to the whites in the city, though, I think, was the fact that um, many African Americans began to play an active role in the war as runaways, they withdrew their labor from the fields and in some cases fled to the uh, coastal areas. This is a contemporary map of the Georgia coast and you can see all the waterways and the intricate streams and so forth where fugitives would hide and in some cases offer their services to the Union Navy. Services as guides, as spies, as boat pilots. And in fact, by the middle of the war, the planters of the area are alarmed, not only by the large number of runaways, but by uh, the fact that their former slaves are playing such an active part in the Union effort. There are calls to uh, summarily execute uh, fugitives because of the role they are playing uh, here uh, on behalf of the Union Navy. Uh, we see, too, that uh, the entrepreneurial spirit of uh, African, and, uh, African Americans in Savannah was very much uh, on display uh, in the course of the war. Along the coast, uh, there were uh, self-sufficient black colonies established. This is Susie Baker King, later Susie Baker King Taylor. She has a wonderful uh, autobiography called Reminiscences of My Life in Camp in print, um, a young African-American girl, she was only 14 uh, when the war started, and she was part of a group on St. Simon's Island, a, an independent black colony that not only grew food for themselves to free, feed themselves, but also marketed surpluses to passing Union gunboats, trying to make cash that way. Uh, and in Savannah, too, many examples of uh, enslaved workers and free people of color rising to the um, opportunities that the distress of the city offered to them. They grew food, they uh, were able to transport uh, goods for the Confederate Army. One black butcher, Jackson Sheftall, made a small fortune through a contract with the Confederate States of America and indicated there, again, the entrepreneurial impulse among the African American community. So we see then the city uh, very much in distress. And that distress, in a certain respect at least, was exacerbated by the entrance of Sherman's forces in December of 1864. This is a uh, drawing that shows the large number of refugees that followed along with Sherman on his way from Atlanta to Savannah. And they crowded into the city in uh, the, at, there at the end of 1864, really adding to um, 
uh, the distress of the city. Now, what is interesting was, again, the way the black community came together so quickly after Sherman's liberation of the city. And one of the things that I look at closely in my book are patterns of African-American leadership. And I find a wide range of leadership styles and temperaments and ideologies. On one side, uh, the preacher Garrison Frazier, who was very much in the mold of uh, Andrew C. Marshall, speaking uh, in kind of a code, urging his congregation to accommodate themselves to the new order, continue to obey their former masters and mistresses. He said, don't steal, don't lie, uh, and uh, we will get through this. Uh, this is one of the leaders uh, I was most fascinated by, James Sims, a former slave who through his hard work as a carpenter bought himself in 1857 and became kind of the Renaissance leader of the black community after the war. He was a labor agent, a missionary, an ordained Baptist preacher. He was a representative to the state legislature. Uh, for a while, he was a judge in the city of Savannah. He was a, a customs house official, a, a fascinating person. And I uh, love this photograph of him, which shows this kind of professorial air. I would call him a militant integrationist and very different from Garrison Frazier. He spoke very directly, very straightforward. He was eloquent. Uh, he, listeners called him the son of Bonageries, the son of the god of thunder. Um, another, uh, oh, and I, I should mention that um, James Sims was the brother of Thomas Sims, a famous fugitive from the city of Savannah in 1851. And I opened the book with the flight of Thomas Sims from Savannah to Boston in February of 1851. This is a drawing of uh, the police officers in Boston who uh, took Thomas Sims down to the docks of Boston where he was put on a ship and sent back to his owner, James Potter, in Savannah and later sold to a, uh, an owner in Mississippi. But uh, a dramatic case there in 1851 which really galvanized abolitionists in the North. In any case, the Sims brothers really fascinating. This is Ta uh, Tunis Campbell, who was a, a northern preacher who came to Savannah after the Civil War and established a series of self-sufficient black colonies. The first was on St. Catharines Island. The second one was at Belleville in McIntosh County. And certainly, Campbell believed that uh, black people needed to take care of themselves and that the best way to do that was through these uh, colonies. Uh, another leader I encountered was Aaron Bradley, who had been a fugitive slave as a young man, had escaped from Georgia, gone north. He had uh, read law in the state of New York and then moved to Boston, where he practiced as an attorney and became well-versed in uh, legal issues. He returned to Savannah in January of eight, in um, December of 1865, and he represented the worst nightmare of the white population of Savannah. He was fearless, and he could quote the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence chapter and verse. Uh, the whites in the city had never seen anyone like him. Uh, fascinating character. We don't have a picture of him. He uh, had flowing red hair. He had freckles. He wore a top hat, kid gloves, and he was able to attract a crowd uh, whenever he stopped to speak on the corner of Savannah. Uh, oddly enough, he died a natural death. I was surprised in the 1880s in St. Louis. But my point here about these leaders is the wide range, again, of temperaments and personalities represented by these leaders. And we see a kind of a two-pronged attack. On the one hand, the drive for full citizenship rights, the right to vote, to sit on juries, to run for office. On the other hand, the drive for cultural autonomy, black families wanting to uh, protect their own, to provide education for their own children, and to run their own volunteer societies. So we see um, black assertiveness in a variety of ways here. In contrast, Sherman's priority was order in the city. And significantly, Sherman ordered that the city council of Savannah remain intact that all-white city council, uh, and he ordered that 
uh, the uh, uh, occupying Union troops cracked down on all signs of disorder in the city. And the result was a continuity of white leadership before, during, and after the Civil War. Edward C. And Edward C. Anderson was uh, mayor uh, of the city elected in December of 1865. He was reelected in October of 1866 and again in 1867. Then military authorities suspended elections for two years. And we see, again, this kind of unbroken pattern of white elites occupying the city council and the mayor's office. Among the most ubiquitous of elites during this period, before, during, and after the war, was Richard C. Arnold, a prominent physician in Savannah. And uh, he was uh, mayor of the city when it surrendered to Sherman in late 1864. He was very cooperative with military officials because he believed that was the best way to restore prosperity to the city. But he was also very adamant that black people not be accorded any civil rights. Uh, he um, was certainly representative of the city elites, but I did encounter some interesting other characters, including James J. Waring, a physician who was a member of the elite from a very wealthy family, the Warings of Savannah, and very much uh, a sympathizer with uh, the newly freed slaves. He believed that they needed an opportunity to own land, to get on their own feet, to provide for themselves, and he was a thorn in the city uh, for much of the Reconstruction period. But in any case, Savannah, uh, the white authorities do attempt to reimpose this order that had been lost during the war. Military occupiers, the Union officers, crack down on black lawbreakers, variously defined, uh, and white judges put black lawbreakers in ball and chain, made them work on the city street in a way that they did not punish white lawbreakers. So uh, again, it's significant that uh, the police department remains all white, the city council remains all white from the war through Reconstruction. Also, uh, the American Missionary Association came south to establish schools for free children right after the war. And uh, they were very suspicious of the Savannah Education Association. Uh, the AMA, very much uh, an arm of the Congregational Church in the North, and it had hoped to proselytize among uh, the African-American community in Savannah and found its way blocked by these independent black churches and the preachers in particular. The AMA determined that the SEA, the Savannah Education Association, should not continue uh, and starved the association of cash. It was overwhelmed by the refugee population, the poverty of its own, residents in the city and by 1866 or so the SEA had folded and the American Missionary Association had taken over the schooling of black children. But uh, what we see then are various forces uh, conspiring to limit the autonomy that drive for independence among the African American population. And certainly on the countryside, planters who returned to their abandoned lands after the war were eager to reestablish systems whereby black workers continue to labor as field hands in the rice and cotton fields. And one of the interesting planters I look at is the daughter of uh, Pierce Butler, very wealthy man who owned uh, rice and cotton plantations uh, on the coast. He was, of course, married to the beautiful Shakespearean actress Fanny Kemble, uh, an English woman. They divorced, however, um, uh, because of her abolitionist sympathies. She lived on the plantations uh, in 1838, 1839. But in any case, they had two daughters, and one of the daughters, uh, after the war, came back to Georgia. She had only lived there as a baby many years before, and she tried to resuscitate her father's plantations using African-American field hands who really resisted that kind of gang labor at that point. Uh, black people's priorities were to bring their families together, to keep women out of the workforce, to uh, nourish mutual aid societies, among the very many interesting his, uh, sources I found for this project, 
were those uh, online sources, Ancestry.com, which has the federal censuses, of course, but also the records of the Freedmen's Bank, where many black individuals and black associations took out uh, accounts right after the war and in the process listed their officers. The individuals listed their next of kin and small histories of their family. Wonderful source that really indicates the um, coming together of individual families and the coming together of these associations. I found more than 100 mutual aid so associations in the uh, Savannah black community right after the war. The Old Hundred Society, the Porterman Society, the Gospel Messengers, the Nightingale Society, the Pulaski Union Association, the list is very long and very interesting. And this is a community that elected James Sims, Tunis Campbell, Aaron Bradley, and others to the state legislature in the course of Reconstruction. Those black legislators, 29 of them were expelled in 1868 by white Republicans and Democrats who argued that even though black people had the right to vote, they had no right to uh, occupy office, elected office. And that uh, caused the federal government to uh, force uh, the state back into a second reconstruction uh, uh, as punishment for that act. Uh, I end the book with um, uh, a discussion of the strategies that uh, whites in Savannah used to keep black men and women from occupying positions of influence within the city. Uh, they were barred from serving on juries, on the police force. Uh, the at-large election system combined with a primitive kind of white primary kept uh, any black people from being elected to the city council. There were various means of voter suppression. Uh, the, Chatham County established a single ballot box downtown at the courthouse, which meant that field hands from the surrounding areas would have to come into the city. There they would face democratic challengers and a very intimidating police force. And um, those measures combined with perhaps the most devastating of all, which was the poll tax, a dollar to vote, which was out of the reach, of course, of most field hands, uh, really reduced uh, black voting power in the city, uh, not only after the war, but well into the 20th century. Uh, I do follow, however, many uh, black protests over lack of school funding, over a segregation of the street cars, and other issues in the late 19th century uh, looking forward. What happened on the coast was that many of these large plantations were eventually broken up, uh, especially in the rice fields. Former slaves really resisted doing that kind of what was called muck work working in standing water in the winter, very dirty, disagreeable, dangerous work, refused to do that. Frances Butler, the daughter of Pierce Butler and Fanny Campbell, tried to get her former, uh, these, her father's former slaves to do this kind of work and they resisted. They wanted to, uh, they wanted to till their own land and she had to resort to paying Irish uh, immigrants a wage to come out to her plantation during the winter to do this kind of work. Um, so what uh, we uh, are left with, I think, uh, uh, is the uh, stark fact that uh, Savannah, th that beautiful city, and many of you are, are well familiar with Savannah today and the way it has been so beautifully restored downtown. It's just, just so lovely and uh, striking when you, when you go downtown. But that, uh, that city was built on the backs of enslaved rice and cotton field hands. And as I walk around the city today, I was just there last week, uh, I'm struck by the number of, of monuments and plaques and other memorials to Confederate officers and soldiers, uh, men who took up arms against the United States of America and now are memorialized and honored on, in the streets of Savannah. Uh, there is really only one memorial in the whole city to slavery, and this is a very controversial memorial with an inscription by Maya Angelou. Uh, it was um, 
uh, unveiled in 2002. It's not a very popular memorial among members of the black community. It shows a family there with the shackles of slavery at their feet. And the uh, inscription by Maya Angelou says something to the effect that we were uh, shackled together, brought together in the holds of slave ship. We lay in each other's feces and urine and then uh, emerged to toil together. Uh, and the city council uh, in the um, by 2001 or so was uh, very uh, leery of that inscription, which seemed to be so harsh, and they feared might kind of turn off the tourists down there on River Street, that they had her add uh, a sentence. And if you go uh, look at the uh, memorial, it says, uh, now we are standing together with some hope and some joy, a kind of more uplifting measure uh, um, statement there at the very end. But, you know, it, it raises a lot of issues. Um, so I end the book by saying um, the generation's old legacy of slavery had by this time, 2002, devolved into a war of words. How best to preserve among the living the stories and sufferings of those long dead. Down on River Street, the African-American monument encapsulates the ironies of memorializing slavery in a place where many people prefer to avert their eyes from a statue with a distressing message. Rendering in words the shocking history of slavery is difficult enough. It's no wonder then that the bitter legacy of that history receives even less attention from Americans determined to scrub from the present the hard truths of the past. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here, Ms. Jones. I just had a quick question about uh, General Sherman when he arrived in Savannah. Was there any uh, reason why the city was spared you know, on the march to the right. sea? I didn't know if uh, there were some factors that enabled Savannah to, yes. to be maintained. Yes, absolutely. It's a good question. Um, and that is one of the meanings of the title of the book, Saving Savannah. The city was spared, really, uh, for several reasons. One, Sherman did not believe the city had any larger military or strategic value at that point. So in contrast to Atlanta, which was seen as a railroad hub, uh, Savannah really had, uh, no, as I said, no strategic value to Union forces. Also, after that long trek from Atlanta, uh, Sherman and his troops were very happy to enjoy the pleasures of the city. The general occupied the greenhouse. The uh, merchant, British merchant Charles Green invited Sherman to stay in his house to save the house. I think Green feared it would be torched otherwise, but no, uh, none of the buildings in Savannah were torched. And Sherman was only there a few weeks, of course, and then he added across the river and up into South Carolina on his trek north. But yes, the city was uh, spared. It had, I think, 35,000 uh, bales of cotton in it. And Sherman, when he presented the city as a gift to Lincoln, uh, December of 1864, made note of the many, many thousands of bales of cotton in the city, which Northern textile mill owners were eager to get their hands on. So there were a number of reasons why the city was left intact, but it was saved. And it was a matter um, of the city council members, quite an interesting story, the way they rushed out uh, the night before John General Geary entered the city, they rushed out to su surrender it in the hope that it would be spared. And for a number of reasons it was. But the city council was instrumental in saying, um, we want to save the city. And by that time, of course, um, 
General Hardy's troops, he had evacuated the city and moved them across the Savannah River into South Carolina. So Sherman faced no resistance. Uh, some people say to me, you know, why do you, dis why do you say Sherman liberated the city? It's kind of an odd uh, formulation, but certainly from an African-American perspective, Sherman did liberate the city. And by the end of the war, there were many ordinary civilians in the city who had faced such hardship uh, they were starving, they were destitute, they were relieved when the war was over. And the war was over for Savannians in December of 1864. So uh, Sherman uh, marvels at the welcome he receives, not only from the African-American community, but from white people as well. In terms of vigilantes before, they were not too much in evidence simply because the forces of, our, of authority were very much in evidence. The, um, and, and you know, there was a tension there before, between letting African Americans do their jobs and contribute to the wealth of the city on the one hand and keeping them in their place on the other. And every once in a while, white workers would say, we really don't like competing with enslaved workers. Uh, it's not fair. But planters and bankers and merchants and lawyers, slaveholders, uh, were making money off enslaved wor workers who hired themselves out. So um, I do find the vigilante problem uh, one of wartime and not the war. And I do see elites in the city saying, whoa, you know, we thought we were in control here and here are these ordinary white men who are tarring and feathering and they're intimidating other whites. This is not good. So I think it really is more a function of wartime. Uh, and in terms of um, African Americans accommodating themselves to slavery, there were a varieties of means of resistance, and uh, we find this entrepreneurial instinct or, or uh, impulse very evident among uh, people. Uh, Susie Baker, um, Susie Baker's grandmother, is a good example of a, an enslaved woman who would uh, grow things on the countryside and then bring them into Savannah to market them, and then she, with her proceeds, she would take those back. Uh, to, the, to the countryside, and she actually amassed uh, quite a bit of money in that regard. So um, there was some, you know, leeway there out in the rice and, and cotton fields, not so much. But um, I do find the religious piece of this to be very interesting, and this kind of sense of an independent organization on the one hand, in the form of these black congregations, and on the other, this these kind of um, subversive messages that are encoded in sermons every Sunday. So it, it's a very, it's a difficult question. But certainly uh, most African Americans consider themselves liberated when Sherman swept through. And if you read uh, the historical evidence, this phrase um, keeps coming uh, through over and over. Um, I was a slave until Sherman came, something to that effect, which meant that when the Union Army swept through, they did consider that the beginning of freedom. Now, many historians have believed that that was Sherman's gesture toward black land ownership. But if you read the record, Sherman's memoirs, the memoirs of the officers who served with him, it becomes clear that Sherman feared disorder in Savannah, like the 
city fathers, the white elites, he really wanted to preserve a kind of order, and he worried about the large refugee population that had accompanied him down uh, to the city from Atlanta. So if you read the um, uh, Special Order 15, which set up these 40-acre parcels on the coast in what was called Sherman's Reservation, he really does say quite specifically he intends those lands for women and children and the elderly. And he expects African-American men to serve in the Union Army. So there's not the promise of land ownership per se, I think. And then by uh, late 1865, early 1866, President Andrew Johnson has made it clear he wants all those lands returned to their white owners. And they are, again, seized from former slaves and returned to whites. Um, as far as first African, I haven't had a tour of the church, so um, I don't know of uh, the holes in the floor. I know that there were fugitives like Thomas Sims, who's a good example, in 1851, when he fled from the city, he bribed his way aboard a boat. And he had, uh, was a skilled bricklayer. His brother, James, was a skilled carpenter. Thomas Sims was a bricklayer and managed to earn money. He was the slave of a very wealthy rice planter, James Potter, who had a plantation, several actually, um, on Argyle Island in the middle of the Savannah River. But Thomas Sims had made enough money so that he could bribe so he bribed some of the sailors and then he made his way to Boston. And I think in general, uh, if you look for paths out of slavery from Georgia to the north, you'd probably look to the sea. Uh, and because there are at least uh, several other cases of slaves who got on these ships and made their way north. It, was, it would have been much more difficult and problematic to travel over land, by, even by any kind of rail, underground railroad standards. I, I think these were really um, men, almost all the men who managed to um, bribe their way on board ships to get out of Savannah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you didn't mention much about the health of the people at all. And the other part was on the money. People were making money. What kind of money were they making? Well, in some cases they were making obviously inflated Confederate dollars, but uh, Jackson Sheftall had a deal with the Confederate um, commissary in Savannah, and he was paid in the hides of animals he slaughtered. So he was paid in kind, and that uh, he was able after the war to sell those hides. So uh, there's a lot of bartering going on in the city. Obviously, uh, the currency is not worth a lot at that point. It's rather primitive economic system. Um, and as far as health, that's a fascinating uh, topic. You know, when I talk about the number of people killed during, in the war, I often say 700,000, although most historians will quote the figure 620,000. But I include the large number of African American slaves conscripted into Confederate service, not to serve as soldiers, but to work on fortifications, to dig trenches, to build batteries, to clear brush, uh, to dredge rivers, that sort of thing. And if you read the record of Savannah and the surrounding area, the mortality rate among those uh, conscripted slaves is extremely high because all sorts of diseases, epidemics swept through the camps, the barracks where these men were kept. Uh, and the city itself had a number of uh, devastating epidemics in the course of the war. And after the war as well, one of the most interesting statistics I quote is the number of dead mules, horses, and oxen picked up off the streets of Savannah by Sherman's troops. These are um, military work animals that just collapsed and were allowed to decay in the city streets breeding all kinds of diseases and really uh, promoting tremendous public health problems throughout the city. Thank you, Jack. Oh. <laughs>
Thank you.